So, hi everyone. Um, so, my name's Becky Lee. Um, I'm working at the Christie and also the Francis Crick. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about biomarkers and how they impact on therapy. So, what is a biomarker? Um, so, actually, it's a, a molecule or some, a substance, for example, a protein or DNA, um, that's measurable, so um, we can find, quantify how much there is of it. And it can be found in any kind of tissue, so, for example, blood or, or tissue or bodily fluids, um, things like urine even people are using. So um, there's different types of biomarkers. So some of them are prognostic. So for example, they can um, show a potential outcome like survival. Um, the other ones are uh, predictive. So they can show the likely efficacy of a, a therapy. And the kind of one of the best biomarkers of that would be um, a BRAF mutation in melanoma where it predicts the likelihood of being able to respond to BRAF and MEK inhibited therapy. Um, and some biomarkers are actually prognostic and predictive. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today um, about a biomarker that I've uh, been working on a lot um, with Paul Lorigan in Manchester. Um, and um, this is um, called circulating tumour DNA. It actually is prognostic and predictive, um, depending on how you use it. So I'm going to give you quite a lot of information today about it. So what is circulating tumour DNA? Well, we all have cell-free DNA in our bloodstream floating around, and that comes um, from things like your immune cells um, breaking down and releasing their DNA into the bloodstream. Now, cancer um, produces DNA and it enters the bloodstream by mechanisms that we actually don't really understand yet. Um, but we think it's probably related to cancer cells dying, um, secretion by immune cells such as macrophages, which, which might gobble up uh, the cancer cell and release it, um, the DNA into the circulation, or um, active release um, by uh, the tumor cells. Um, so how do we measure it? Well, we, the first thing that we do is we take a sample. Um, in our uh, trials, we do uh, blood samples, um, which um, we then spin down um, and get plasma out. Um, and then we can extract the DNA from that plasma. And then we use lots of different techniques um, to read the DNA. Um, and um, there's different ways of doing that. So we can either stitch it together, because it's in different fragments in your blood, and look across um, the whole, even genome, um, of the, the cancer. Um, or we can look at a really specific area. Um, and the way we quantify it is um, using something called variant allele frequency. Um, and that's essentially the number of mutations that are present compared to normal at that specific area um, of the DNA. Um, and so you can see here uh, where we've got five strands of DNA um, and one uh, in the red dot with a mutation in it. If uh, we then um, uh, divide that by the number of total strands, then we get 20%, and that's your variant allele frequency. And what we know from multiple different studies and lots of different tumor types, and this is all kind of preclinical work in the laboratory, um, that the higher the amount of circulating tumor DNA, um, the, the prognosis for the patient is generally poorer. Um, and actually, the benefit from treatment, um, independent of treatment type, is less. So I've given you a couple of examples here of um, uh, where they've looked at the pre-treatment level of circulating tumor DNA for both targeted therapy and immune therapy, and shown um, in the bottom lines on those curves that um, if you have um, high levels present, then you're more likely to do do badly with the treatment. And so in terms of applications of this um, tool, um, well, actually, there's many different applications. So if we take um, a primary melanoma um, and take it out, um, we can basically look for whether there's um, cancer still present in the bloodstream uh, using the circulating tumor DNA. Um, and then we can actually monitor patients um, and identify relapse early, and I'll give you some more information about these aspects. 
We can also then look at the levels if patients unfortunately do progress um, and prior to their treatment predict the likely outcome from that treatment. And then actually um, on treatment, if you manage to clear the ctDNA, um, then actually that's associated with better responses as well. Um, and then unfortunately, if you then progress on treatment, um, you can then look in the circulating tumour DNA for potential mechanisms of resistance, and that may then inform your next um, line of treatment. And so many different ways that we can use it. So in terms of um, thinking about it for the clinic, um, so one of the major things is how acceptable it is um, to patients. Um, and some of the things that we have to think about is how often that you go and get your blood tested and how we give you um, the results as well. And we've done some work on this recently. So the volume of blood is really important because some of the tests um, benefit from increased volumes, but actually, um, Obviously, we don't want to make people anemic through taking it too much, so we have to balance that out. Um, some of the tubes that we use, we need to fill them up, and also um, some of them have preservatives, so we can then send the tube centrally and test them in our special laboratory. Timing is really important, and that really affects kind of what test um, that you use to identify the circulating tumour DNA. And so some of these tests can take between two to three weeks to get the results back, um, whereas other ones can take even, um, you can do it within a day. So depending on how quickly you need that result back um, depends on what type of um, test you might use. Kind of going along with that, some of these tests are quite complicated and they need um, bioinformatics support um, to try and analyse the results. And again, that adds time and also potential cost um, to doing the test. Cost, unfortunately, does um, factor. So um, if you're doing multiple tests along um, a long time course, then the cost can ramp up. So, so that has to be something that we do think about. But obviously, we try and keep those costs down. And then um, we need to basically standardize the test so that every single laboratory, if they were to test using the same method, gets the same result. And that's really important um, for the clinic. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples today um, about how we're using circulating tumour DNA within clinical trials um, that you could potentially uh, participate in. Um, so the first is looking at minimal residual disease and molecular relapse monitoring. Sorry, it's not moving on. Um, so as you all well know, um, the way we currently treat um, melanoma, and this may change um, in the UK, but pr at present, um, if you have early stage melanoma, so it's not spread to lymph nodes or anywhere else, um, then you um, are currently followed up and observed in the clinic. Um, whereas if it's spread to the lymph nodes, um, then we might offer adjuvant therapy with um, some uh, either targeted or immune therapy. And then if um, you have a cancer that's spread everywhere else, then um, you would be offered um, other uh, systemic therapy treatments. But we know that patients um, with early stage disease, although reassuringly they have a really high chance of being cured by surgery alone, so about kind of 70 to 80 percent of patients um, wouldn't ever have their cancer coming back, and I think that's something to bear in mind. Um, but um, because there's a lot of those patients um, getting diagnosed, actually, um, if you look at, at the statistics, then overall, um, if those pa if a few of those large group of patients um, go on um, to then get melanoma coming back. Actually, they contribute to about 30% of melanoma deaths. Um, and so really what we need to do is find who is actually going to get their melanoma come back um, and spare the other people um, from getting treatments that potentially have got um, side effects and long-term side effects. So just to kind of explain some of the concepts. So... Um, when we look at after surgery, um, the hope is obviously that you are cured um, from your melanoma. Um, but we do know that there are some patients that we could then um, detect the melanoma coming back by um, imaging, so by CT scans. Um, 
But there are this proportion of patients which, who return with minimal residual disease where we can't see it on scan, but we know that um, it's still there because the patients in the end um, relapse. So some of these patients we're now able to pick up um, with uh, the circulating tumor DNA test. But there is still a proportion of um, patients that we can't detect um, either by CT DNA or imaging. But over time, um, because as the tumor gets a little bit bigger, it starts producing maybe a bit more CT DNA, we then start detecting more patients. And that's still prior to um, seeing um, the cancer coming back on the scan. Um, and we term this molecular relapse. Um, and that's because it's so tiny, you can't see it on a scan, but we can detect it with the circulating tumor DNA. And so some of the things that affect the sensitivity um, of our test is essentially what we're doing is we're looking for a needle in a haystack. So if you've got more needles present, then you're more likely to pick up um, the circulating the ctDNA in this case. Um, and so you might think, well, I might get more blood um, and have a bigger volume. Um, and that's great because you do get more molecules of um, circulating tumor DNA, but you also increase the size of your haystack. So it's harder than uh, still to find it. And we call that um, the background noise. So, um, and that's affected by things like the volume of blood, um, if you've got an infection going on, actually time of day. So um, as you go through the day, um, your cell-free DNA decreases. So um, it's probably better to get your test done um, in the afternoon, depending on your clinics. Um, and um, also, if you do intensive exercise, that can also increase um, the amount of cell-free DNA in the blood. So, one of the obviously important things to think about is um, what patients think um, about this monitoring. Um, so we did a recent study and it was helped by Imogen and um, also by Melanoma Focus. So um, thanks to everyone for, for helping with this study because it was, it was just as uh, the pandemic hit. So it was really difficult to recruit people. Um, so we got some really interesting thoughts from patients. And so some patients felt um, like Yvonne and these names are changed. Um, so uh, it's like a belt and braces and it's more scientific. Um, so she really liked the idea of doing the circulating tumor DNA test and also doing something preventable if you detected uh, the CT DNA. But there were other patients which, who were a bit more unsure about the test um, and felt that if you couldn't see it on a scan, um, then why treat it? Um, and so I think we've done a lot of... Um, uh, kind of preclinical work trying to say, well, we think it's highly likely um, that you have the cancer there if we detect this um, circulating tumor DNA. Um, but what we don't know yet, and I think um, Jean here makes an important point, we don't know whether treating it early could actually benefit patients. So that's why we've um, developed the detection trial. So this is basically hypothesizing that if we, that the circulating tumor DNA can detect um, this um, micrometastatic or uh, tiny disease, um, and also if we treat it early with immune therapy that we could be benefit patients. And we're basing this on the fact that some studies have shown that if you have higher amounts of um, tumor present, then you have um, a less, less of a response um, to checkpoint inhibitors, such as pembrolizumab. And this is um, the trial schema. So um, essentially, we've got over 1,000 patients, and that's over 15,000 blood tests that we're planning to, to do for people. And we're monitoring them at the time that they come for their clinic visit. And then if we detect um, the circulating tumor DNA, we, they get randomized. Half will then continue on their kind of standard follow-up, and that's kind of like a placebo. And then um, half will go on to early immune therapy. And the trial's currently open at the Christie um, and Oxford. I, uh, we're happy to take referrals as well. And so just to kind of move on to um, patients with more advanced disease, so how can we combat um, cancer resistance? And so um, uh, many of you may have um, encountered BRAF and MEK targeted therapies. So these are for patients with BRAF mutant melanoma and affect um, the growth and survival of the cancer cells. 
Um, and unfortunately, as you can see from these sad pictures of this gentleman, who had a really great response initially to the treatment, but unfortunately then um, relapsed. And obviously we want to try and prevent that from happening. So why does it happen? Well, we know that it's probably due to cancer evolution. So you may have heard this concept um, in antibiotic resistance, where essentially um, when you give a drug, um, if you have the green cells which are sensitive and then the red cells which are resistant, if you give drug then basically the sensitive cells die off, but these resistant ones start to grow out. Um, and if over time they start to grow more and more, then actually um, the cancer progresses and becomes resistant. Then you might start giving a new treatment, and again, there may be some resistant cells there in the dark blue, um, and um, as time goes on again, um, they grow out. So this is cancer evolution, and this is our challenge, really, um, especially with targeted therapy. So... There is some good news. So there is an Achilles heel of um, the cancer. So these resistant cells, um, they're actually, they don't do so well if drug is not, not being given um, uh, than the sensitive cells. So they're less fit because of the ways that they've um, adapted to the treatment. And actually, within a tumor, there's a lot of competition for resource for things like nutrients and oxygen. Um, and if you have the drug off, um, then basically those resistant cells, um, they don't win that battle um, between the, the sensitive cells and the resistant cells. And so what we would, if we take the treatment off, so if, if you have the treatment on, um, then basically those resistant cells will start growing out. But then if you take that treatment off, um, then actually those resistant cells, they don't grow so well. Um, and, but the sensitive ones start to grow. And so they outcompete um, in that battle. And if you keep doing that, um, then with the treatment on and treatment off, then perhaps you could delay uh, resistance to that treatment. So how do you work out when to put drug on and when to take it off? Um, and actually, we've um, developed the circulating tumour DNA for this. So we've been able to show um, that um, for monitoring um, of patients, then CT DNA is really great. So if you look at this patient with um, uh, the blue line, which is um, we're following the BRAF mutation, and then they go on a BRAF inhibitor called encorafenib, you can see there's a really big drop in the circulating tumor DNA levels, and then it starts to rise as, as the cancer gets worse again. And you can see as well the resistance mechanism is through developing an NRAS mutation. Um, and again, um, the scan is also showing the resistance occurring, but actually we see it in the blood um, earlier. And it's also a better test um, than LDH, which um, sometimes um, we can test for in the clinic as well. And so the principle of this is if we start giving the drug and we look at, monitor these ctDNA levels, we see a drop um, and then we take the drug off. And then at some thresholds that we, um, alongside some very clever mathematicians, have modelled, um, then we start putting the drug back on if we see this rise in the circulating tumour DNA. Then, um, again, we take the drug off as as the ctDNA starts dropping, we put it on again um, when it starts rising, and we keep doing that. Um, and, um, and then we ho are hoping to then prevent that resistance from occurring. So um, this is just a trial schema, so we, we, it's called Dynamic. Um, it's going to open in autumn, um, and probably autumn um, this year. Uh, first of all, at the Christie, and then uh, quite a few sites throughout the UK. Um, and basi basically, patients either go on to standard continuous do dosing or uh, this adaptive ctDNA guided treatment. And so, just to conclude, circulating tumor DNA has the potential to be a useful tool for the clinic. We don't know for sure whether it is or not yet, so we're testing that in clinical trials. It can be used to monitor for minimal residual disease or molecular relapse, predict response to therapy. Um, it can be used to identify mechanisms of resistance to treatment, 
and also optimize scheduling of treatment. And so we've got ongoing trials, um, which um, feel free to contact me about, um, uh, which we hope um, can impact on treatment and improve survival for people. So just to acknowledge, there's a huge team of people behind this, um, and also um, to acknowledge all the patients and families and their families that have participated so far in our studies, um, and also the funders of our research. Thank you very much.